I would now like to introduce our next speaker uh, of our first workshop, and that is Dr. Gabriel A.K. to talk about the outlook on democracy. My talk and lecture is on uh, the outlook for democracy. Wait, where did democracy start? The honest answer is we, we don't know. Now, we are aware, however, that the, the Greeks in Athens had a people's democracy. And that's about 2,500 years ago. So essentially, democracy is an ancient topic. It's not a modern topic. Now, somehow, it's scarce nowadays due to the colonial disruption of organized communities. When did democracy start in Africa? Well, again, the honest answer is we don't know. But we do know, however, that African nations and kingdoms had distant democracy many centuries before the advent of colonialism. Basically, colonialism brought a curse upon Africa. That's the bottom line of that disruption. Now let's go to the definition of democracy. Now, the purpose of this conference is to help us on learn, relearn, um, and focus our learning in the right perspectives. To define democracy, there's all sorts of definitions out there, and they're probably within the sense of it, but I'll put it simple. It's where a knowledgeable people agree about the sovereign management of their collective affairs. So they have to be knowledgeable, and they have to agree, and they have to have some sovereignty in managing their collective affairs. Democracy also has objectives, and it only has two objectives. The first objective is that the people directly or indirectly make decisions about public affairs. And there has to be an easy way for the people to have a determination of the outcomes in their own homelands. Any such mechanisms must be filtered through the knowledge and the aspirations of the peoples from the respective localities. It must not cost the people a ransom under any guise to exercise the rights to self-determination. The next and second and final objective of democracy is that the people have an equity of the commonwealth. There has to be a guarantee of basic or standard welfare for all the people from the polity. And this is a mandatory outcome of governance. Now, currently in Nigeria, well, Nigeria has a feudalistic ultra aristocracy. At the moment, and for quite a long time, it doesn't have democracy. Now, even though in the past, and perhaps maybe 60 years ago, it might have had a little bit of democracy. Of course, you have nations within Nigeria as a geographical expression that actually had democracy many centuries before colonialism. Now, let's look at the process of democracy. So, the process of democracy empowers the people, the ordinary people, not necessarily the opposition party, but the people. It empowers them to empower a government or an administration. 
it empowers them to question a government or an administration. It empowers them to disempower a government or an administration. So that first process of empowering a government or administration, well, the government or administration can be empowered by the people after a consensus or a constitution via legitimate and fully inclusive elections. So boycotted or walk over elections that are void of a consensus are therefore not democratic or legitimate. Now, an empowered administration will ensure at least one, if not both objectives of democracy. So this is why a people's consensus is indispensable. It is indispensable and it needs to be meticulously harnessed. Now, the second part of the process is the question, the ability to question the government or question an administration. The people must have a direct means of questioning you know, the administration, whether by a rapid public inquiry, lobby groups, uh, political groups, media outlets, direct social actions, which could be like protests or even revolutions. Now, an administration that guarantees one or both objectives of democracy usually gets less questions because it is in tune with the people. An ability of the people to question a government or an administration must not be impeded under any guise. And the final bit of the process is the ability to disempower a government or administration. So usually you have agreed end of term for an administration, and that could be the disempowering, it could be resignation, it could be inquiries, it could be strikes, it could be impeachments, it could be protests, it could be revolutions, etc. Now all this can signal the disempowerment for an administration. The more judicious an administration is in implementing the objectives of democracy, the more likely it is able to complete the agreed term of its duty. The next thing is to look at the criteria of democracy. There are four criteria in democracy. The first one is the free will of the people. So the people have the full right to vote or not to vote. They have access for all eligible voters inside and outside the polity. It's important to note here that if, if, if an election is rigged, any rigging of an election basically cancels the free will of the people. The second criteria is the knowledge of the people. So the people have to be educated, well informed about the process of democracy. We're not talking about education as in just going to school or being an engineer. No, we're talking about being educated about the process of democracy itself. That's really important. And if you go to villages or places, remote areas back in ancient times, even probably recent times, the people are aware of how their community is managed. They are well versed, well in tune, whether they're young men, or, you know, teenage girls, young women or old men, they all know how things are done and managed in their communities. They're well versed, they are well educated. Okay. So the other one is the consent of the people. So the consent of the people is really important. Elections cannot be conducted without the consent of the people. Final criteria is the consensus of the people. Uh, a significant percentage, or in fact, the entire number of people should be involved in the agreement of constitutions, mecha mechanisms of you know, governance, etc. Now this implies um, clearly that the early and possible lengthy discussions might take place in forms of conferences, meetings, lectures, debates, referendum, etc. And these will precede democracy. You have to have this consensus. And the smaller the polity, the easier or quicker consensus or constitution can be achieved. And the role of a natural constituency 
which is a nation of people having the same language, similar culture, that's a nation. Um, they are a natural constituency, and it's quite easy to achieve a consensus in that sort of setting. When you start getting 500 nations or 20,000 nations together, you begin to have a lot of problems, okay? Um, now, the role of a natural consistency is really important. It has an advantage here in getting a consensus. And, it, um, and the other thing, obviously, is a well-informed people um, will not struggle to achieve consensus. There's also another important factor in getting a consensus. Where you have a lot of injustice, a lot of grievances, it's difficult to get a consensus. Um, so the issue of justice before democracy comes up. Um, now, if you don't take anything from this lecture, um, there are a couple of things you need to take home. And the first one is this, that elections cannot be legitimate in the absence of democracy. Okay, so where the objectives, the process and the criteria of democracy um, you know, are non-existent, elections cannot be conducted you know, until the peoples or nations involved complete a mandatory discussion, dialogue, meetings to achieve consensus or constitution. The last thing you want to take home here is elections in the absence of democracy is actually a crime against humanity. So in the absence of the aforementioned tenets of democracy, those who mean good for the polity will actually boycott all forms of disguising or faking of democracy by criminal elements um, within amongst politicians. Now, every nation coming to Nigeria now, every nation to conclude out of these 371 or thereabout nations in the geographical expression of Nigeria must have their own lengthy conferences. They must have their own meetings, debates, lectures, referendum, etc to achieve a consensus within themselves for their own future. And this is the mandatory path to success. Otherwise, all attempts to continue to you know, misgovern nations will only yield more crises and more failures. And I don't think we have time for such going forwards. Thank you very much for listening, indeed. Thank you, Dr. AK, um, for that um, detailed outline about um, the outlook of democracy. I think we've all heard you cover the definition, um, the objectives, the process, and the criteria. And I'm sure there are many people that are looking forward to debating this further in the breakout rooms. But prior to going to the breakout rooms, we have four discussants uh, who uh, are, uh, will be providing uh, their points of view uh, on what's just been presented. So the, the, the discussions all have five minutes uh, and very much uh, the same rules around timekeeping applies here. So the first discussant I would like to invite uh, is uh, Mr. Tai Waiedu, uh to um, come forward, please. All right, uh, Dr. A.K., thank you so much for delivering a uh, focused uh, paper on the outlook for democracy. Um, I, I wanted to hone in on uh, a specific uh, aspects of your presentation that has to do with uh, uh, political uh, political consensus. Uh, to, but there you go. So, um, yeah, I wanted to expound on, on, on the power of consensus in achieving uh, political performance. And so I started by saying that, okay, what key problem does democracy or a democratic society aim to solve anyway? And I chose one key uh, problem, and that would be political performance. And what I mean by that is that we want to have a society where everybody has liberty and the freedom to pursue happiness. We want to have a, a progressive society, uh, a society that has improved well-being and quality of life for everyone, where there is peace and harmony, uh, and then a country that is a global, a good global citizen. And of course, uh, we want to be able to do all of these all of these things by trying to elect leaders, you know, that have a combination of skills and uh, attributes. You know, they want to be inspiring, visionary, compassionate, capable. They have organizational skills and so on and so forth. Um, but in order for us to um, actually achieve political performance, we have to be able to hold accountable uh, the politicians that we elect. Okay, so that is a key, uh, that is one key aspect that we have to focus on. And why? Because these leaders may have all of these skills, um, but they're still human, right? Um, they have, they're liable to human flaws, like all of us. And these flaws may affect performance 
um, enable corruption, uh, they can be nepotistic, they can be tribalist, they can be divisive. We have examples with Trump in the United States. Um, they can also be influenced uh, by lobbyists and they would do things in the interest of uh, elites as opposed to the, those who put them in, in, in power. So if we can have a mechanism, uh, the political accountability mechanism to, to enable the electorate to reward good behavior, such as pledging support, uh, loyalty to the uh, elected politician, the president as it were, or um, uh, a, a local political leader, we can help them with, with, with uh, re-election. And we can also punish bad behavior. Um, so I think that's, that's a key aspect. Uh, we have to have accountability mechanisms to be able to achieve political uh, performance. Well, what do we need uh, to be able to have uh, political accountability, to be, to be able to enforce it? Uh, Dr. Eke touched on it, and, and so I wanted to read the experiment. We have to have consensus, okay? Uh, those being governed, have to be fairly unified on a set of principles, aspirations. They have to have consensus. Otherwise, if the electorate is, is divided, then certainly uh, the politicians cannot be held accountable because they will exploit that division to escape accountability. So, so let me drill down on, on, on that some more. And Dr. Okay already, already touched on it. Uh, so consensus obviously is, more, is the achievable when you have a highly homogenous population. Uh, than across uh, heterogeneous population. So an example is that you know, within an ethnic, ethnic group, they are much more likely to have similar cultures, language, outlook, expectations, and so on and so forth, versus across multiple uh, ethnic groups. Uh, consensus is also achievable uh, in small communities. So if you have a nation uh, that is highly ho homogenous, you can have settlers, you can have immigrants. And, but within small communities, uh, a class of people can also be, um, you know, they can also have some, some, some level of, of cohesion. And as long as they're small, and an example of a community, for instance, is the fatherland community. We're a small community, and um, we have an ideology, some aspirations bringing us together, even though we come from different backgrounds, uh, you know, we have different ethnicities, but we can sort of hold ourselves accountable. So these are the two mechanisms that are very, very important. And uh, from a national standpoint, uh, a highly homogeneous population implies political auton uh, autonomy for ethnic uh, nationalities. So let me summarize um, what I've been saying. Basically, empirically, we can find that when you have community cohesion or you have cultural homogeneity, you find performance. So it is a necessary condition, okay? And you can look at the list of the best functional democracies in the world, and you'll see that they're all highly, highly homogenous. But of course, it's also insufficient though. So some things also have to work, right? Uh, it, it, it's a necessary condition, but insufficient uh, to achieve demo democratic performance and success. Um, from these, um, I like to say that we need to concentrate political power at the community level and at the ethnic nationality level. Uh, political consensus and therefore political ac accountability can more easily be achieved at such a level. This much better, uh, much better guarantees political performance and success. Um, also, we need to permit the, the electorate to determine the territory of governance. Uh, this is the Swiss model. And I think uh, Mr. Bigley will be talking to us about, about the Swiss model uh, later on. Um, I also believe that a direct democracy is much better than a representative uh, democracy, uh, because representative democracies sometimes um, uh, basically remove the power of the people once they've elected a representative. And that representative can easily, can easily be uh, influenced and they can be captured by, by elites. So, so I want to present that the, the direct uh, democracy model that you want to be followed. Let me conclude. I'm hopeful that if we were lucky to achieve our objective to, to have some self-determination for ethnic nationalities within Nigeria, I hope that our founding fathers will not be paternalistic, but they will trust the people to ultimately make the right decision in their best interest. And the best interest of the people is the best interest of our nation. Uh, we know that no political system can prevent the emergence of a divisive or corrupt leader. 
However, when that leadership emerges, we want to make sure that we have a system that can prevent damage. Um, a bad leader with concentrated power at a higher tier of government can cause more damage in a nation than a bad leader with concentrated power within, it, within one community. Therefore, we need to design our system to limit political power at the higher tiers of government. Okay, because those tiers of government are much further away from the community. The owners of the government reside in the community. So therefore, political power must be delegated from that level of government at the lower tier, delegated to the, to the upper tier of, of, of government. And one of the limited uh, delegated powers to higher tiers of government is the ability uh, to prosecute political corruption at lower tiers of government. Therefore, there is already a check in that design to hold corrupt leadership accountable at the community level. And the limited powers at the higher tiers of government also provide a check. Uh, that's the end of my, of my discussion uh, on, on the paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ayedun. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. David Okorududu to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I hope that my, my below friends on this platform can hear me. Um, I want to call the organizers for an excellent job as usual. Uh, let me just point. We are working on the place of a Western style of democracy that emerged from ancient Greece. Um, therefore, my evaluation was predicated on the limitations of this for an African society, the Africans. And as Africans, people who were grouped into this Westphalia construct called Nigeria, we had nationalities, the Shekiris, Robos, the Jaws, Yoruba, etc. And we had a Way of things. I, I'm going to let me make a point because we've got five minutes. My first problem with democracy, as enunciated properly by the speaker and by Dr. Uh, Mr. Deleogo earlier on, is that still democracy is a 51% major rule. It's a majoritarian style of government where whoever gets 51% commands authority, government resources for the next four years in spite of the plebits and the referendums and all the other many uh, of content with that democratic mandate. A poor country where the government commands the economy, democracy will fail. And because in a place like Nigeria, the commanding heights of the economy uh, uh, are in the hands of whoever captures government. And as we meet, the very trapping and the nature of Nigeria itself is flawed. The governmental system is flawed. Uh, we work on the a thin constitution. Institutions are not representative and they're not effective. Therefore, once you have party A become the, the, the party of government, every excluded, uh, opposition politics suffers. So you cannot critique and evaluate their policies properly because of the opposition want to join uh, the government. That's a big problem. The other thing I'd like to point out is only a truly free people in federal republic, and those two words important, can participate in the democracy. Uh, in far as the people of India are under the, uh, the, the, the servitude of imperialism, uh, uh, domestic and foreign, they cannot really have a democracy stop those because our elections are rigged. The, the final point that I would like to make is that we need to rebuild the decision-making process amongst the ethnic nationalities. I'll give you an example. Igbos before democracy came to Nigeria had their town youths and they realized that they had an educational deficit. The only elite school in the East was Government College, uh, uh, Umwa, brilliant school that produced uh, uh, Achille and all of them, Chris Okigbo and uh, uh, Sarawiwa. And so Igbo town unions set up schools and in addition to setting up schools, it sponsored their brightest to go abroad and be. And this is where uh, uh, Akweke Arizu Uru came to prominence. My point is that they did that for democracy, and within three years, they were able to cap educational, educational barriers with the euros. And so my point is that you've seen Igbo local democracy work advanced. They haven't done that well post-independence. And so we need to look at this. The Yorubas have the Roko tree system of representation before democracy, where the elders 
uh, and the heads of households would get under an Iroko tree and discuss and debate with Nuance until consensus was achieved. The Shekiri, Zaimi Shekiri, have the Ubajo Shekiri or the Otoloye, where basically the Ojo, the the, 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 the head families, uh, the leading figures will come under the aegis of the king and the issues. Urubos, our neighbors, have what is called the Aguari system. They Come to limit. They keep talking to until, until they come to agree. My 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 thesis is the need to rebuild the decision making process amongst the ethnicities that make up the Nigerian political space. Let's do that first. Let's return dignity and sovereignty to the peoples, and then we can discuss um, uh, how we fashion a democracy for a country, uh, both for it and both a federal system. I thank you very much, and uh, may God bless our proceedings. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, David Okorodu, for that. Uh, I'm sure many people will want to explore a bit more of that in the breakout session uh, that we'll be going to shortly. So I would like to invite um, Mr. Kunle Kasumu. Okay. Well done for um, a job well done, and I commend the leadership of Fatherland for this very excellent conference. Um, <clears throat> Listening to Mr. Ogun and Dr. A.K., I hope I pronounced his name right. I apologize if I, if I did not. You know, reminded me of the constant um, battle between the ideal and reality. Um, I, I need to say that I am completely in agreement with um, both papers. Excellent, very excellent, very on point. But it reminded me of the, the, the battle between the ideal and reality. As we speak right now, INEC has released the timetable for 2023. The elections, preparations for the elections are underway. Politicians are jostling, negotiating, raising money, campaigning. And elections will go on in 2023, except... Like my friends in the maritime industry will say, <laughs> except for the act of God, 2023 will happen. There will be elections in 2023, except something, something happens before then. Uh, so as much as, uh, um, like Dr. Eke has rightly said, that there really is no, no uh, um, we can't talk about elections without true democracy, the factors of democracy being there. The truth is that there is a Nigerian state right now governed by laws in Nigeria right now, whether the laws are legitimate or not, whether the 1999 constitution is legitimate or not, it is the law governing Nigeria at the moment. And when the courts say that an election is legitimate, it is legitimate. We have a government now in Nigeria based on uh, um, the courts stamping its authority you know, validating the election that was held in 2019. There is a government right now. We may not like it. We may, we may say it is uh, an illegitimate government. We may say it is not a well-functioning government, but there is a government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria now. You know, so when I look at the, the ideal versus reality, it worries me a lot uh, because we all know what the ideal is. Uh, it has been rightly uh, uh, um, elucidated by Dr. Ek. Uh, so it worries me a lot, a lot, because here we are talking brilliantly, but out there, something else is happening. I think that uh, um, we need to seriously begin to look at how to collaborate. I, and I know that is already going on. But if there's something we need to step up, it is collaboration. Collaboration amongst uh, the minds that understand the way forward, the solution to Nigeria, the various individuals and groups. It has to happen. And there has to be a long-term plan. There has to be. If we talk about boycotting the 2023 election, this is May of 2021. It's May 2021. It's less than two years to elections. You know, so if, if we are looking at the grand plans that will deliver Nigeria, we need to begin to think long term. If we are looking at uh, uh, um, establishing true democracy that will ensure either restructuring or break away, you know, whatever is a preference, we need to have a long term vision. We need to start looking at the next 10 years and, and start collaborating and start thinking about how 
you know, we can make this thing happen. Because those who hold power in this country, they are not going to give up at all. Elections have been fraudulent since 1959. The 1959 election was fraudulent. The British, we all know what they did in 1959. 1965 was terrible. It led to a complete wreck of the First Republic, it led us to war. 1979 election was fraudulent. We know what happened, the two-thirds story. 1983 was terrible. It led to a coup. 1993, we know what happened, the annulment of the election. 1999, we know the story that brought in Obasanjo. 2003, 2007, name them, we all know. But we continue, the country is ready for another election. So what exactly, I don't have all the answers, to be honest. Uh, and um, I mean, forums like this help us to pour our minds out and begin to throw up ideas. You know, I don't have all the answers, but we need to begin to think a bit more strategic, a bit more long term. There are a lot of voices now. Um, uh, um, people want uh, um, secession, independent states, ethnic groups and all that. A lot of different voices. But I still notice that there there still is no co cohesion, no collaboration, you know, and that still poses a problem because here we are still heading for another election and the one after it will be the same. So um, we, we, Fatherland Group, fantastic, fantastic group. Um, we, we can lead this, begin to look at how we can collaborate with the different groups and all that, how to make the voices united. What, what happened in 59? What happened in 65? When, when the British handed over power to the NPC, they had made sure that the North had majority. They had 50% in the parliament. There was no way the election was going to be fair. Never. And the South was not united. The East and the West were divided. The same thing is still happening now. So a lot of brilliant individual voices and groups and all that, but there's no cohesion. There's no collaboration. It's back to the 60s. It's the same thing happening now. You know, so as much as the ideas are brilliant, as much as we know the solution, the more homogeneous we are, the more powerful we can be, the more effective we can be, the more independent the nation states are, the more effective we can be. We know that. But how, what do we do to make that happen? And I think the answer to that is to seek ways to collaborate so that we can actually make democracy what it ought to be in this part of the world. That is all I have to say on this subject. Once again, thank you very much, and I thank the um, organizers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Customer, for that, uh, for that input. So I'm sure many more people would want to explore that further with you uh, shortly. So we'll, I would like to invite our uh, last discussant for this uh, workshop. Uh, that is um, Tola Mubolurum. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Let me congratulate uh, Mr. Dele Ogo and everybody behind this conference. Um, it's been interesting, and I'm sure that you know, I will enjoy the interaction. Uh, let me start by saying that you know, um, I must thank Mr. Kasumu for his uh, presentation because it brought us uh, back to the reality of our current existence. Uh, I enjoyed reading Dele Ogun's uh, paper as well as uh, Dr. Eke's. I find uh, Mr. Ayedun's presentation very interesting, and I will probably like to have a copy of that uh, because it sets out every, it sets out the framework in a manner that is intelligible and easily and easy to follow. Uh, I think we all agreed that you know democracy existed in our societies long before colonialism. Uh, but I think we also know that uh, what we have today as democracy is really not democratic in the sense that it has such flaws that uh, it distorts democracy. But that's the reality of our lives. And as uh, Mr. Kasumu said, it's been there from independence, or even before independence. Uh, it's getting worse, because if I can give an example, in, in 1999, uh, 
when the elections were going to hold. I think one retired general was reputed to have given Obasanjo 200 million naira or something like that. And that was one person. Uh, I'm not so sure that Alliance for Democracy, that won throughout the Southwest, had anything close to 200 million naira. Now, when you look, when you, you can question, where did the 200 million naira come from? Of course, it came from the coffers of the state, stolen over the years. Uh, and it continues because every election is funded largely by money stolen from government. And that's why it's so easy to buy the electorate. Now, the electorate, do they have a choice? I mean, like somebody said, the more Nigeria gets richer, the more the people who are poor in Nigeria. Now, if people see what is happening, they are cynical, they are disenchanted with the situation, they are alienated from the situation, the result of the election has nothing to do with their welfare because the people who get elected don't care about the welfare of the masses. So why should they care about anything? So they take what they can, they can get. We say they are, they are unenlightened. The, the solution is not to hand over the franchise to the elite that is educated. Because the elite that is educated is part of the problem. The people who are ruling us are not illiterate. They are friends. They are schoolmates. They are, we go to the same social club. We socialize together. We party together. They are the ones that are the problem. So when the, when the masses look at us, they look at us with the same eyes that they see the politicians that are corrupt because they are your friends. Have we have the people who have values distinguish themselves from those who don't have values? You know, it's easy for us to say, well, you know, in our old society, it's intimate. We know the scoundrels. We know the vagabonds and all that and all that. But have we, as the elite that seeks the good of the society, distinguished ourselves from these vagabonds that are invariably in the same social class as we, and our friends, they see us party together, they see us socialize together. Why should they make a distinction? And I'll tell the story. Uh, in 1979, uh, late MKO Abiola's wife ran for the Senate. In those days, you paid the Electoral Commission some money as deposit. Uh, and if you didn't get 10% of the vote or so, 10% or 25% of the vote, you lost your deposit. And you know how rich Abiola was. The wife spent a lot of money. They bought bicycles, motorcycles for people and all that. She lost and she lost her deposit. What was the difference? The candidate of UPN was riding on the reputation of the leader of UPN and they ran on the basis of a manifesto that promised free education, free health for the young uh, and the women, and also integrated rural development. They knew from the records that if they voted UPN, they will get whatever was promised. Politics or politicians of, the, of that time had integrity. They were not saints but they were known to be accountable. They had some degree of selfless leadership and they were committed you know, to raising the living standards of the people. So um, thank you, Mr. Mubolun, for that. We, unfortunately, we are on a very tight schedule as we mentioned.